Okay, well, hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for our presentation today. Let's Okay. All right. A little technical difficulty with our microphone, but thank you for joining us today for the presentation. Uh, please let us know if there are any other difficulties that we have as we get going. So as Paul mentioned, we are doing a session today on um, osteoarthritis and farm use, titled Creek, Crack, Moan, and Grown. Farm kids get arthritis, too. And this is a topic that is very important to those of us involved in agriculture because we don't generally think about some of the safety aspects related to arthritis with the younger generations. We still tend to think about arthritis as an aging person's disease, and it's not always the case. So as we go through today, if you have any questions, don't forget to put those into the chat window, send them as an email, um, or wait until the end and put them in as, um, as a question that we can answer as we go along. As we know, agriculture is a very hazardous industry to work in. In general, we know that there are a little over one million children who have been raised on farms, and over half of those are working in some capacity in one of the, the types of situations that they might be in, whether that's livestock, row crop production, gardening, machinery, etc. In addition to that, we hire several youth to work on farms every year. The concern that we have is that some of these youth, whether they're raised on farms or not, might not be ready to do some of the tasks we're asking them to do. Maybe they're not ready physically. Maybe they're not ready mentally. But either way, we're starting to see more and more issues of um, a little bit of a predisposed issue of arthritis showing up in some of these farm youth. So we started to do some research here at the Agribility Project and working with other groups to determine, is this a topic that we need to be concerned with, and what can we do to have some outreach and education in those areas? Right now, on the adult level, over one-third of farmers in the United States have some form of arthritis. Now, we say some form because that could be any of the different types that we are um, familiar with, such as osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, gout, lupus, etc. But all of those, in some way, are going to be a limiting disability for a farmer in their operation. The average age of the U.S. farmer is also increasing, 57 to 59 years of age on average. However, most of those farmers don't tend to just retire when they hit 65 years of age, but instead they start asking some of the younger generations on their family farm or their hired employees to start taking on more and more tasks that they're no longer able to do. By moving these into those younger generations, we're simply transferring some of the difficulties and stresses and strains onto their bodies. So one thing we need to be considerate of is if we are seeing this trend in agriculture of younger generations taking over the work or hiring employees to take over the work, how is that affecting that working dynamic? Some of the questions that we asked were, are more farm youth taking over tasks that they're not physically fit for? Is their body not just physically capable to handle the amount of stress or the weight that they're carrying or pushing, et cetera? Are they capable of handling those tasks even mentally? Are they prepared for the type of job that they're going to be able to do? Uh, have they been instructed appropriately so they know what they're getting into? And are there other factors in their life that might affect their joint strength, things that we need to be considered of, such as their weight or their genetics or even other injuries that might have occurred through sports or school? So let's talk a little bit about what specifically is juvenile arthritis as opposed to osteoarthritis in adults. And then we're going to move into a little bit of the risk factors and some management. In general, arthritis itself just simply means the inflammation of a joint. That can occur in any joint in a person's body, and it's going to be different depending on what type of arthritis might be present. Juvenile arthritis is simply the term used to describe arthritis in children. The most common type that we hear about and that the Arthritis Foundation works with is juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which just simply means that there's unknown causes. We're not sure why some of these children as early as 18 months old or younger are having difficulty walking or why they're running high fevers or having other issues that are starting to affect the joints and the lining and the synovial fluid in their bodies. However, with osteoarthritis, it's a little bit different. It's another form of arthritis that can affect these children. Juvenile arthritis affects children of all ages, all ethnic backgrounds, and in general, we have almost 300,000 children in the United States today that are affected by some form of one of these rheumatic conditions. The form that we are most concerned with, being involved in agriculture, is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is simply a degeneration of the joints. It is a wear and tear type arthritis where the joint has simply been injured 
or it has been overused, or it has been stressed or strained to the point where that joint itself is physically breaking down. Many agricultural workers are at risk of osteoarthritis, but they don't always know about that risk. There is a common misconception that because uh, farm workers and farmers and ranchers are physically working all day long, that they are healthy and that they are fit. And that's not always the case because some of those very repetitive and forceful type of tasks that they're doing tend to increase their risk of osteoarthritis. It's not necessarily a normal part of aging. Some youth tend to um, ignore osteoarthritis as a problem for them because they think that they're too young to have to worry about it as a problem. But in reality, it is a, a severe risk for some of our farm youth. Why are they at risk specifically? One, they have a general lack of experience. Even for children and youth who are raised in a farming situation, they might have observed certain types of tasks and jobs being done repeatedly, but that doesn't mean that they themselves have had the experience of completing that job, or maybe they haven't had the, the proper training to do that. They might just be, in general, unfamiliar with the work. If you hire young farm workers uh, in the summer, maybe you hire high school students to help set up hay, or maybe you have uh, hired someone to work in a breeding operation. They might know, in general, what they are um, expected to do, but they might be very unfamiliar with each individual aspect of the job. They're not always quite prepared for what they need to do. In general, with youth, their enthusiasm sometimes outweighs their judgment. They are um, risk takers, and they're very driven to succeed. They don't like to ask questions. They want to be able to prove to their employer or to their family that they are just as capable of completing those jobs as an adult would be. Because of that, they tend to put themselves in situations where they are more likely to be injured or to where they're going to abuse and stress their bodies to the point of injury because they don't like to give up and quit very easily. Some of those factors and risks that we're going to see on a farm, specifically for our farm youth, they do have to worry about stress. In general, we think that might be something that affects adults a little bit more, but stress can also affect some of our farm youth. They're still worried about market prices and how it affects their family and if they're going to have enough money to continue to farm with their family. Um, they might be concerned about their animal's health, if they have show animals or if they have production animals that they're in charge of. They could be worried about how they're going to balance their schedule and manage their time between school and work and maybe even sports. And some of them also stress about their diet. They are worried about, you know, what are they eating and uh, are they eating too much or are they eating not enough? All of those types of uh, issues can contribute to stress, which is also a contributing factor in arthritis pain. We ask them to do jobs that are going to overuse their body and overuse their joints. Youth will very often be lifting or bending, carrying, um, pulling and pushing things that they're not quite ready for. Their bodies aren't physically capable of pushing the amount of weight or lifting um, the, the poundage in a feed bag or in some other equipment, but they're going to find a way to do it anyway, even if it abuses their bodies. We also need to be concerned and think with um, talking to them about their general overall weight and age and is there an appropriate level of tasks that they need to be doing. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the guidelines for these tasks later as well as talking about weight and some of the other external factors listed there, like um, youth being expected to work in extreme weather, hot and cold conditions, uh, working with livestock that might be uncontrollable, causing accidents and causing injury. And every once in a while, we still might have a youth who is working with machinery that even though they um, are not capable of or maybe they haven't reached the age requirements for, if there's a malfunction with that machinery, it could also potentially lead to injury. So some of those general stresses um, that we will see on the farm, things that are going to physically start to um, cause that degradation of the joints in osteoarthritis, the whole body vibration that some of these youth are exposed to, whether they are riding in tractors, combines, um, grain trucks, even lawn care equipment, riding on lawn mowers or using weed eaters, causes a lot of whole body, body vibration that's going to affect their joints. We ask youth to hitch up implements that they might not be um, ready for as far as backing machinery or lifting um, an implement onto the hitch and getting things set up with chains and um, other techniques that need to be done. Throwing and stacking hay is a very common job for a lot of farm youth. Um, right now in Indiana, now that the rain has stopped, 
you'll see youth out on wagons all day long. Um, the coveted position is always that of driver and the person driving the tractor, but that generally tends to go to that older person who's earned that right. So then you have the youth that are either walking through the field, picking up heavy bales of hay. An average square bale in our area weighs up to 60 pounds. They have to throw it up onto a wagon. They're stacking it up onto stacks that are higher than their own bodies and then unloading it into barns. That's a lot of repetition and a lot of extra weight. Youth are involved in taking care of livestock work, whether that's feeding, watering, milking, all of them, again, very repetitive, very forceful type of motions, um, and dealing with a lot of weight as well. Fixing fence is never a fun job, but it's something that um, at some point in time, almost all farm youth have been involved in if they have livestock on their farms. Whether they have a tractor with a, an attachment in the post hole digger, they're still going to be off on the ground stretching wire, um, using fence post drivers to drive in T-posts, et cetera, using tools that might not quite be um, perfect or, or a good fit for their bodies. And hand tools, that brings up a good point. Uh, in general, hand tools are a great way to get the job done compared to some of the older um, static tools that we might have used on the farm, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a youth is prepared to use that hand tool. And again, if they're not prepared, if they haven't followed the safety procedures, they're opening themselves up to injury. So I mentioned before that we know about juvenile arthritis in general across the United States, but we don't really have a good number of osteoarthritis in farm use. It's not something that we've had a lot of research on. So we've done a little bit of our own research here at the Agrability Project. And we're going to share a little bit about what we have found out with you. What we have done is we created a rural youth survey uh, with help from the Arthritis Foundation and a physical therapist that we've worked with before to ask some very general questions of farm youth about difficulties they might have in their day, how old they are, what type of tasks they're commonly completing in their jobs, and how comfortable they feel actually accomplishing those tasks. So we did uh, a good set of surveys. About 414 responses were returned across both Indiana and Illinois, generally working with 4-H groups and local high school SFA chapters. So nearly all of the students ranged in age from about 14 to 18 years of age. The average was 16 and a half. The average residents, so the majority of the residents, all lived in a small town or a village in generally rural areas, but not necessarily um, farming populations. 68.3 of them had done some type of farm labor in the past or were currently involved with farm labor. And about 60% of them were male students that answered the survey and 40 to 41% were female. So we're still seeing a trend where it's not um, a huge swing to all male farm workers when they're young, but we are seeing a lot of females starting to work on the farm as well. Some of those questions that we asked them related to things about difficulty entering out of vehicles, difficulty using hand tools or feeding livestock, and we asked them to answer each of them on a scale that would give us a way to um, evaluate their responses. So of those 414 responses, what we found um, were that we ranked them on four different levels, that the youth had no difficulty at all completing different tasks on the farm, they might have had some difficulty, much difficulty, or they had actually been to a level where they were unable to complete a certain task on the farm due to joint stress, joint pain, uh, limitations in their ability to have a range of motion or grip strength, et cetera. So you can see by our chart here that the group that was unable to physically do a task is still fairly small, which is what we would have expected with a, a younger audience. But the two largest categories coming in there at um, either no difficulty at all or having some difficulty take up a good amount of our pie chart. Most of these students that we talked to said, in general, that they had noticed that perhaps once or twice they would have a pain when they tried to complete a job. It wouldn't be enough to stop them, but it was enough for them to take notice that something had occurred. In general, we noticed that most of them were answering questions related to their backs and their knees. That's where the majority of their pain has started to show up. And that makes sense if we start talking to these youth about the type of jobs they're doing, as well as things like their weight and the stress that they're putting on their bodies. So what we have started to do is working with these farm youth to explain that arthritis is something that can affect their overall quality of life. It is something that they need to be considerate of. It is something that we need to talk to them about changing their routine, managing their pain, and understanding what that pain means in their bodies. So 
So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those management techniques. We're going to talk about some safety methods in this next few slides, uh, and also talk a little bit about weight control and use. So methods of our arthritis management that we tend to share with these youth are, first off, it's important that they actually do see their family doctor and go in for their yearly checkups. That's the number one person who's going to be able to help them identify if they're having arthritis pain early on in life and how they can start combating that now so it doesn't affect them as they continue to grow in age. We also want them to get proper exercise and watch their weight and diet. And for some youth, they don't tend to like to, to talk about exercise because they think that they participate in gym class at school or they might participate in sports after school. Participating in those type of endeavors isn't exactly the same thing as cardiovascular exercise. So we try to explain to them a little bit about the benefits of doing some low-impact exercise, just something as simple as walking. We also talk to them about weight and diet. For every one pound a person is over their target body weight, they actually add four pounds of additional pressure to their weight-bearing joints, specifically their knees, but that could also affect their ankles and their hips. So we, will, we can explain to these children that if for some reason at 16 or 17 years of age that they are 10 pounds over their core target body weight, they're actually adding 40 extra pounds of pressure to those weight-bearing joints. So it's going to be more difficult for them to get those jobs done. Any time that they can understand their, their level of uh, weight control and their level of exercise, that's going to help them to manage any potential difficulties they might have. We talked to them about age-appropriate farm chores, which we have a couple of examples here in the next few slides. Growing up on a farm, I know that we were just expected to do whatever was needed. But now looking back, I know that some of those things my family and I probably weren't quite ready for, uh, even though we were asked to do those things on our own family farms. Most children have been taught at some point uh, how to properly use their bodies as far as lifting with their legs and not with their back. But that doesn't mean that they're always going to think along those lines of body mechanics and ergonomics and how to use the right tool. So it becomes the responsibility of the older generation on the farm, or maybe an employer on the farm, or even uh, rural professionals like agricultural educators, 4-H uh, and youth extension agents, or rural medical professionals to talk to these youth about the proper ways to use their bodies and to understand how ergonomics works. We also know that there are several tools available that some youth will like to use because it makes the job easier. Uh, however, some of these assistive technologies or tools might not necessarily always make it better for that youth's body. Uh, they might not know how to properly use the tool, which might cause additional injury, or they might be using it in an improper way, which isn't going to get the job done, but uh, might actually make more work for them in the long run. We also talk to them about trying to manage their stress, balancing their family and school and work life um, with a good time management technique, understanding that um, while they are responsible for things on the farm, the overall stress level doesn't need to rest solely on their shoulders. So they can understand a little bit more about their overall health in that way as well. And then we also talk to them a little bit about um, making sure that if they're going to find a way to manage some of their pain, that they're not just using um, a remedy that they've heard of on the Internet or that someone might have passed down to them, but that they do need to be working with someone in their family or a trusted adult to help them manage any pain that they might have. That's going to prevent a lot of future injury as well. So some of those age-appropriate tasks that we talked about, two excellent resources that any of you can use at a later date from this webinar are the North American Guidelines for Children's Agricultural Tasks, and then several extension websites across the country from land-grant universities have resources available for youth and ag and farm safety. The ones that I've brought into the presentation today come from the North American Guidelines and Penn State. They have an excellent resource that breaks down the different types of jobs and tasks on a farm based on a youth's age. So we're going to go through a few of those now. The North American Guidelines for Children's Agricultural Tasks gives a list of well over 60 different types of operations and jobs that youth could be doing on the farm. And each one of them has a flyer or a sheet like you see on the screen here that really breaks down what type of task is it, what are the questions that you need to ask both yourself and the youth worker to determine if they're capable of that job, and also gives you a level of supervision. So if at a certain age a youth is ready to feed livestock independently, it lets you know at what age can you, um, what age do you still need to supervise them or maybe check up on them every 20 or 30 minutes and then moving on to letting them do that job independently. 
So a good example um, of some of the things that I pulled up for this presentation today, there are a, there's a good list of the top ten types of tasks that we ask youth to do on the farm. And it gives the guidelines for each of those, starting out with number one, working with large animals that you see on the screen here. And moving all the way down, number 10 is unloading hay. And I chose those because those are two industries that we see quite a bit here in Indiana. And just this past week at our own county fair, I saw several youth who were in charge of feeding their livestock, unloading and even driving and maneuvering their own trucks and trailers, working with these animals in confined areas. And at most times, there would be a parent there in some way to supervise. But there were also a lot of those youth who had reached 14 or 15 years of age who were doing it independently. And luckily, we didn't have any issues, but there are a lot of ways where we could have seen something potentially go wrong. So these types of guidelines that you can pull up online show you things like, uh, things like the main hazards involved. So with working with livestock, it will bring up um, factors such as you know, animals can move quickly and bite and um, could potentially uh, squeeze a person in a chute that's going to cause injury to those joints. It talks about the weight of feed as that those youth might be carrying or the weight of water buckets that they would be carrying, putting stress and strain on their shoulders. So these types of guidelines are a great resource for anyone to use. They are free and able to be printed at any point in time. And they're great um, resources that you can hand out to groups of youth that you might work with, or you can include in newsletters as you're doing your outreach to those youth in the rural areas. I highly recommend taking a look at some of those topics. This chart that you see on the slide right now comes from the extension website um, that I found through Penn State. And again, a lot of your land-grant universities that have extension programs will have these type of resources. I specifically like this one because it really broke it down very well with the age groups on the left and then gave some good examples of the types of tasks that these kids could be accomplishing at this age. I have children that range in age from 4 to 13 years of age. So knowing now by looking at this that some of them can be doing certain tasks while others aren't quite ready for it helps me to evaluate what I can ask them to do. Now one problem that we do run into, however, is the younger children tend to want to be with some of their older siblings on the farm. So if you're working with really young children and not just high school age, maybe farm employees, it's very important that we have a lot of supervision there so they're not getting into trouble in some way. So if you look at this slide, you'll see some examples about, um, for example, a 10 to 13 year old is able to start using a lawnmower, um, maybe a push mower or only mowing on flat surfaces with supervision, but they're not quite ready maybe to use a bush hog attachment or an implement on a larger tractor, or maybe they're not quite ready to do um, ditches and roadsides where they have a lot higher um, possibility of rollovers with the tractors. So each of these types of job tasks increase with their age, but they also include supervision, and that's one thing that we have to consider as education, uh, educational experts or if we are extension admirability staff, or even farm employers on this webinar, it really does become a, a responsibility of ours to make sure that we assess the youth and their abilities to do these jobs, but also that we prepare them by giving them the proper training to do each of the tasks that we ask them to do. So moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we prepare them for ergonomics and how we might provide those youth with um, the proper tools that they could use in these farming tasks. Basic ergonomics is just simply finding a way to make sure that that farm use has the physical capabilities to do the job in partnership with the right tools that we might give them, the environment that we ask them to work in, and then what type of job is it we're asking them to do. So, for example, if we have hired uh, farm youth, maybe high school age students to work on a dairy farm, if they're going to be working in extreme cold weather in the wintertime, are they prepared for that? Have we given them the proper clothing and have we given them the right safety attire and really explain to them what the task is that they're going to be doing before they get started? It's always easier to train them beforehand than to try to stop and go back and fix the problem that's occurred in the middle of the job. So we need to make sure that these youth are uninjured, safe, comfortable, but also productive. Uh, the, the whole reason for having farm youth either living and working on the farm or being hired on the farm is because we need to increase production in these agricultural operations. Maybe we needed the extra set of hands or it's a family operation that needs to support multiple people. So we need to be able to do that by maybe even looking at redesigning the type of tools that we're providing for those youth 
or are we looking at um, a certain type of the operation that might work better for that use? Perhaps they take over just the um, livestock production but don't have any involvement in row crops, or maybe they take on some of the um, the selling and the, the production of crops or local vegetables for a farmer's market. Giving them a very specific level of work and a specific job that they're capable of is going to be much more productive in the long run for everyone involved. Some of the things that we can do um, to help prevent arthritis, pain, and prevent joint injury could also be very beneficial for the adults involved. This is not just a list that would only work for youth. But in general, making sure that we're educating anyone involved on farm work of the dangers of jumping on and off of wagons and machinery, the amount of impact and the shock absorption that happens in the ankles and the knees when someone jumps off of machinery is tremendous. Finding a way to educate them on the proper ways to mount and dismount up and down ladders or by using a set of movable steps is very important. Uh, encouraging the use of, of those mounting aids or steps. And, and I know, again, from my own experience, that sometimes it's just easier to jump off the back of that truck or to jump off that hay wagon rather than waiting for someone to bring you a set of steps or a mounting block. But in the long run, it's going to hurt much more by doing it that way. So taking the time to really make sure that every action has the appropriate movement and consequence. Uh, if age permits, use utility vehicles for use to be able to, to travel around the farm. Every four-wheeler, ATV, gator, mule, side-by-side -side has age requirements on there, and they're very well marked, and they're very visible. Making sure that all employers and farm families follow those rules is extremely important to prevent um, danger and prevent injury. But if that youth is old enough, that takes a lot of extra stress off of them by giving them another way to um, move feed or hay or other heavy loads without having to use their bodies. Using adjustable seats and stools for workbenches or using adjustable type of tools um, could benefit them greatly. Most youth don't have the same size grip in their hands or the same strength in their hands uh, as most adults do. So all tools are not universal. They're not going to fit a youth worker as well as they might fit an adult worker. So finding ways to increase the diameter on those handles might be beneficial. Something as simple as duct tape or even um, some PVC pipe to give them a better grip would help tremendously if they're going to use that tool quite a bit. Now, saying that every tool in the farm has to be changed to fit the use isn't going to be feasible either. So again, that's where it takes the employer or the family to say what type of tools will this youth be using and how can we make those safer for them. Making sure youth are educated on the proper techniques for working with livestock, making sure that they have um, the, the right education on what type of clothing and personal protective equipment they could use, why it's important to wear gloves, why it's important to have boots that have a good ankle support and good anti-slip tread, um, as opposed to wearing flip-flops or tennis shoes around the farm, can all go a long way towards preventing injury and pain. Other things you can think about are um, additional mirrors or adaptable handles and controls on machinery because, again, some youth can't reach the same pedals that an adult could or they don't have the same range of motion and vision um, on machinery as an adult would. So those extra handles and extra mirrors would go a long way as well. Other things that we can do uh, as far as assistive technology to help these youth Give them longer handles on tools that they might not be able to use or reach as an adult would. Um, again, the larger diameter handles that I mentioned with tape or PVC pipe or pipe wrap. Using support braces can be very helpful. Again, you might not find a lot of youth that are very receptive to putting on a back brace or putting on a brace on their hands or their wrists. But if we can show them how it supports those joints and makes those joints stronger, preventing injury, then perhaps we can get them to wear them during most of their jobs and tasks on the farm. Other things that we can try to get them to use on a routine basis are step stools. Uh, they have very easy, small folding step stools that can go in and out of every vehicle um, and be used in any type of situation. So always having one of those on hand is beneficial. Using those utility vehicles or specialty tools, like we mentioned, but also, especially, for example, if this is a family-type operation, if there's use on the farm, maybe we're looking into, you know, modifying the whole operation a little bit. If we know that that use is going to be very, very involved in the livestock side of the operation, maybe we downsize the herd a little bit and specialize the genetics, or maybe moving to a different type of livestock if that use isn't capable of handling a certain species or a certain breed that's already there. 
maybe we change the crops a little bit or products if a youth wants to specialize in a certain crop or, again, maybe run a farm stand or a, a farmer's market stand. Giving them the responsibility level there is going to make them, uh, it's going to entice them to educate themselves on the proper techniques and how to do the things that they need to do. And again, always maybe possibly hiring even more employees is an option, taking a little bit of that job load off of each of those individual youth so they're not having to work quite as hard with their bodies. Some of those tool adaptations that can be done, um, again, also could benefit some of the adults, things like using air suspension seats for shock absorption in machinery, um, even using things like shoulder slings or um, a, a push cart, a two-wheel push cart to carry feed and water through the barn. Again, just gives that youth a little bit of a, a method to take that weight off of their bodies. Um, the general rule of thumb is whatever type of, um, whether it's a bag of feed or seed or um, something they're pushing, if it exceeds 10 to 15 percent of that youth's body weight, it's too heavy for them to be working with. So you need to make sure that we're adjusting whatever that task is to that individual youth size. And two different 16-year-olds on the farm might have such a huge swing in weight that one of them might be capable of pushing and delivering feed to the cattle, but the other one might not be. So that's something we have to take into consideration. Other things that we need to worry about um, might be the height of some of the tool benches. Again, youth are growing rapidly, or some of them might not have hit in their growth spurt yet. So maybe we need to raise some things up to their level so they're not stooping and, and bending over so often in the barn or in the machine shed. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the current resources we have out now through the AgriAbility Program, um, some things that we are pilot testing and sending out for rural professionals and ag educators. We have um, started working on a classroom lesson that is available for high school agriculture teachers, uh, 4-H educators, um, Farm Bureau educators as well. And we have it in two different methods. We have a, hand, a, a written curriculum that's available for grades 7 through 12 that has three individual lessons that can be combined to one long lesson or used individually that also includes some classroom, hands-on, lab-type activities to really show these youth what they are doing to their bodies when they're um, adjusting to these different tasks. And it comes with all of the content, the talking points, the slides, et cetera. We are also um, finishing up pilot testing this program with some of the schools here in Indiana. Um, we received feedback from over 300 advisors and youth themselves in our programs. And we've taken all those changes and modified this lesson plan to really make it the best possible resource we can provide. From that, we have also started on a web-based version of this lesson plan. So uh, some of those schools who now have distance education programs or if they have a snow day and they have students working at home on iPads to continue their lessons or their credits, we're putting together this program to where a uh, high school youth could go through this independently. They would go through the three different content sections online going through and clicking at their own pace, viewing uh, YouTube videos, clicking on PDF resources with additional information that they can read at their own pace. And then at the end of each section, it requires them to take a brief quiz. And it gives them multiple chances to take and pass that quiz, but they aren't able to advance further until they have passed it with an 80%. By the time they finish all three of those sections and watch all of the um, additional videos and the additional resources that are available, they can then print out a certificate at the end that allows them to show that to their instructor and let them know that they've completed that entire course. So that's a great way that we could get more youth to go through these type of programs for credit in class and not necessarily take up uh, important class time that's based on some of the standards in agricultural education where they have to have so many hours of in-class instruction. So this really gives us a way to, um, to set aside all the different audiences we might need whether it's an independent use, like this type of web lesson plan, or it's a full lesson plan that an educator might use in the classroom. So those resources are um, currently available to anybody who might be able to utilize them. However, we are still making some final edits and some final changes. So um, they're not quite in permanent form yet, but they are able to be used in some form if needed. And if you have any questions about those, please make sure you put those in the chat room as well. And I think at this point, um, since we went through all of our content, we're going to turn it back over to Paul for some of the review questions uh, and polls and any of your questions you might have for us today.
Thank you, Amber. I appreciate that presentation. At this point, we will um, invite you to uh, submit any questions in the chat window, or if you would like to uh, ask a question verbally, you can use the raise hand icon, and we will attempt to uh, activate your uh, web microphone. While we're doing that, I would like to um, give you a so I will open the first one, and it simply asks about your affiliation as to what type of um, organization or agency you're uh, employed by or affiliated with. Now, you do need to actually uh, make sure you hit the radio button next to your choice. And you have to hit the Submit button, too. You can't simply highlight the choice. It has to, you have to click on that button next to it. Give you just a few more seconds to complete that. Looks like we've still got... There's one person still taking that. Okay. Close that. And hopefully you can see those poll results. <laughs> so, our second poll question. Asked about the information that was presented today. Please respond as to whether you felt that the information uh, was uh, valuable to you and what you expected. Again, please remember to hit the submit button after you've clicked on the radio button. I have one other request while we're doing our polls. If you have multiple people at your site, um, could you please note that in the chat window? Sometimes we have uh, one person log in or uh, an organization log in, but we're not sure exactly how many people are actually participating in the webinar. So just in another couple seconds, I'll close that poll. Okay. And I believe you should be able to see those poll results. I apologize if you weren't able to see it the first time. I didn't click one of my buttons. So, um, next question asks about the technology today. You could tell us if you found the technology to be usable. If you had any specific issues, any problems, we'd appreciate you uh, entering that information into the chat window also. Just a couple more seconds on that. And it looks like everybody uh, did okay. We didn't have any major problems, it appears. Our next question asks, if you would participate in another of these sessions based on today's session.
of that pile. And there were the results for that. Finally, we'd like to uh, know how you have heard about today's session. So please choose the most appropriate of those possible responses. We realize that they may not fit everyone, but if you give it your best shot, we appreciate that. And if you have any specific uh, information or comments, we'll have an opportunity to do that after the, the Q&A session. Just a couple more seconds on that. Okay. Looks like uh, email announcements were the most prevalent means of finding out about this. All right. At this point, I'm going to turn things over back to Amber and to our technical coordinator, Cliff Raz, and see if we. Uh, have any questions that can be addressed? I need to make one adjustment here. Okay. Well, the first question we heard comes through says, I still have a hard time understanding that farm kids have arthritis. Is there different language that might have less of a stigma, like joint pain in kids? Um, absolutely. Again, like I mentioned at the beginning, arthritis does tend to have a stigma to it. Um, anytime we did the pilot testing of these lesson plans in these FFA and 4-H groups, their first response was, why am I interested in arthritis? I'm not old. I don't have arthritis. I, I, I can do things just fine. I'm young and I'm healthy. So that was something that we had to try to get past them and get over that to them. So we try to talk to them more about uh, the ergonomics and the prevention of pain. And one way we've been able to do that is kind of showcase the different people around them in their lives. You know, how do you see them struggling now? Um, and do you think they had these issues when they were your age? So we do tend to talk to them more about joint pain and difficulty moving and difficulty doing jobs. Um, we tend not to always overuse osteoarthritis a lot. That does kind of throw some kids off. But just in general, asking them to understand that a joint pain is a, a form of arthritis and it is going to potentially cause them to have difficulties later in life. So we can't simply throw out arthritis as a, as a name for any of this joint pain, but you're, you're correct. We do tend to um, try to gloss over that a little because some kids don't associate themselves with having arthritis because of their age. Good question. Okay, and looks like we might have one more question. I'm waiting for that to come up. Okay, this is a key recommendation for a farmer with rheumatoid arthritis to help get up and down when doing maintenance on equipment. Okay, um, so we had a question question come in about assistive technology for a farmer with rheumatoid arthritis um, getting up and down working on equipment. And again, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, they're all going to affect someone differently. Um, every individual is going to have different limitations to their, um, their abilities, whether it's limited range of motion, maybe it is limited grip strength. Um, specifically with rheumatoid arthritis, we see a lot of issues with symmetrical joints. So um, not knowing this individual, we might, um, we might think that they might have difficulties in both of their wrists, both of their knees, et cetera. Getting up and down to work on farm machinery tends to be very difficult. Anyone who's ever had to work on a tractor has probably seen someone climb up on the front tire of a tractor, lean over into the hood to try to get their work done. 
which puts them in a very precarious and balanced situation. It also puts them um, at a difficulty of being able to reach their tools and, and get their work done. So again, without meeting this individual and really seeing what their limitations are, just a basic suggestion would be finding a way to use maybe some portable steps. Um, have a local fabricator weld up a set of steps on wheels to where they can wheel them up to each individual side of the tractor. They could have a little shelf where their tools could be with them, and then it would be easier for them to either, you know, mount and dismount up those stairs. We also have seen some farmers who use lifts to get themselves up and down, um, like an, an on-max scissor lift that would take them up higher or down lower if they weren't able to physically climb in and out because of their knees or other examples. Um, so again, without knowing if it's the rheumatoid arthritis affecting their knees or their back or even their hands, those suggestions would be some things to just find a way to um, get them up and down around their tractor, but that doesn't necessarily answer the questions about can they do the work with the wrenches or any of the smaller hand tools as well. And that's why we have staff here that could um, individually work with those types of people to see what kind of barriers they have and then what kind of assistive technology we could recommend to them. Do we have any more questions? Okay, it looks, it looks like at this point we have no more questions. Uh, we thank Amber for her presentation today. And uh, finally, I'm going to uh, open the uh, comment uh, poll. If you have any specific comments or other questions you'd like to ask, feel free to enter those into that poll and we'll uh, be able to get those uh, directly. Also, I'd like to make a plug for the Arthritis and Agriculture website. It's www.arthritis-ag.org, and that has been recently updated. If you would like further information about anything related to arthritis and agriculture. So thank you, and uh, again, if you have other comments, please stick around. I'll open that pod for you. Otherwise, we uh, again uh, thank Amber. Thank you for participating, and, and wish you a good day.